check, 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 one, two. Test, test. Lost track of time. Okay. Hey, good morning, church. So good to see you. Feel free to come in, grab your seats. Whether you're online or in the parking lot or here in person, we're glad that you're here. Thank you for joining us. And I uh, want to go ahead and let you know that there are guest cards in your bulletins, or you can go to soundchurchtx.com guest and fill out a guest card. That way, when you do, we will fund a microloan in your name as a thank you for coming. And so we just love partnering with our guests as a way to say thank you for coming and also as a way to make a real world difference and, and bless an entrepreneur in a developing country. So we appreciate if you took advantage of that. Of course, we'll follow up with you and we love reaching out to you and, and we want to get to know you. So we'd love for you to do that. Let me go ahead and pray and we'll begin our service this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, we quiet our hearts before you. Lord, we come approaching your throne in prayer, recognizing that we are in the presence of a holy God who loves us unfathomably, who cares about even the, every hair on our head, Jesus says. Lord, your, your word says that your thoughts about us outnumber the grains of sand on the shore. You love us, like we said, Lord, beyond comprehension. And so, Lord, you've gathered us here this morning, and we pray, God, that you would use it for your purposes. We pray, Lord, that, that we would be sensitive to your Holy Spirit, that your Holy Spirit would join our service in a special way, that you would anoint our worship and our listening and our preaching and all that happens here this morning, Lord, that it would glorify you, that it would, that it would be pleasing in your sight. Lord, and will you use it? Will you move in our midst in a deep and powerful way? We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good morning, everyone. Let's stand up and praise our God in this morning. Amen. All right, let's go. Here we go. Oh, my God. 
Yes, I know. But when, but when the world has seen the light, they will dance with joy like we're dancing now. Yeah, come on, the chorus. I could see now. to the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. We worship. Sing with me. You call me out. You call me out upon the waters the great
be seated. I want to go ahead and let you know about a couple of events coming up, a couple of announcements. The first one is this, and we've already talked about this before, but in case you haven't heard yet, we're having coffee and donuts in our fellowship hall before service so that in between services, people have an opportunity from both services to kind of get to know each other, get to see each other, say hi to each other. And because I really like coffee, and so, you know, it's a bonus for us to be caffeinated here on Sunday morning love for you to take advantage of that. I also want to let you know that there's a church work day coming up and it's Saturday, May 15th. That's this Saturday, right? Yep. This upcoming Saturday, there's a church work day from 9 a.m. until noon. It's an opportunity for us as a church to care for the grounds that God has blessed us with. And, and it's a great opportunity to, to get to know each other too and have some fellowship. And so we'd love for you to do that. In fact, there are some sign-up sheets in the, the back table there. If you're interested or you know that you're planning on coming or thinking about coming, take advantage of that. It also helps us because we get to send you reminders. And, uh, and so love for you to do that as well. Lastly, last thing I'm going to mention, there's more announcements in your bulletin, but there's a Sunday fun day next Sunday. So this upcoming Sunday, the next time that we meet together for church, after church, we're going to head to the POA park. The POA park is just up the road at the POA office um, in April Sound here. And we're just going to go to the park and grill out and have fun together. If you want to bring a side dish or a dessert to share, you can, but it's just an opportunity for us as a church to spend some time at the park together, having fun together. We'd love for you to take advantage of that. Also want to let you know, we're going to move on to um, our time of, of worship through the giving of our tithes and offerings. You can do that in the offering box in the back, or you can give online, soundchurchtx.com slash give. But really, this is an act of worship. It's a time for us as, as believers in, in Jesus to say, God, I recognize that all that you've given to me comes from your hand. And I just want to confess that I trust you and, and pray for your continued provision. If you're new here, we don't want you to feel obligated to give, but I do want to encourage you, if you're a, a, a longtime member of the church or if you want to give as a way to express worship to God through sacrifice, through giving, now's an opportunity to do so. Whether you give online, whether you give to a different church or, or whether you haven't explored giving yet, let's go ahead and, and pray and use this time to just say, God, will you continue to provide for me and, uh, and maybe to pray for those that, that lack provision, that are going without. So let's do that now. Let's pray. Lord, God, we love you. Jesus says that you're a good father who gives good gifts to his children. So we want to just take a moment, Lord, and recognize that all that we have, in one way or another, it's come from you. Lord, and you've asked us to be stewards of it. And we want to surrender our whole lives to you, Lord, including our finances. We truly want you to be Lord of our life. And so, God, we give to you as, as a way to say thank you. We give to you as a way to, to celebrate what you've done in our lives. We give to you as a way to join you in the work of your church. And we give to our, as an acknowledgement, as an act of worship that says that you are my provider and I trust in you, Lord. And I want you to be, I want you to be Lord of my life. And as we surrender our finances to you, God, I just want to take this time to pray too that you would continue to lead us and guide us and shape us. God, help us to fall more and more in love with you. Help us to trust you more and more like that song talked about, Lord that you would lead us to a place where our trust is truly without borders, that we wouldn't hold back from you or reserve anything from you, but that we could just truly trust in you, Lord. Lead us there, disciple us there, Lord. Help us to follow you 
with our whole hearts. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand up all together.
be seated. Let me go ahead and pray for us. Heavenly Father, Lord, Almighty God, we pray that you would use this time for your purposes, God, that we would be receptive to your spirit, sensitive to your word to us this morning. And God, may it, may your spirit anoint this message and, and may you, Lord, may you speak powerfully to us and may, may your truth today resonate deep within us, Lord. May we experience you and be changed by you. We love you, Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're in the middle of a series called Fix Your Focus, and in it, we're looking at this passage from Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount, where he, in particular, will talk about two things to focus on and three things that he would like us to avoid focusing on. And so today we're going to talk about, this. we're in our second week, today we're going to talk about how we fix our focus by looking at the world through a lens that brings us joy, to find joy by changing the way that we look at the world. And of course, there's some common ways that people tend to look at the world, some common perspectives that we tend to take. The first one you could say is idealism, where we might look at this glass of water and we might say, man, this is the perfect glass of water. It was meant for just this moment. Or we might say, one day everyone will have a glass of water like this one. And of course there's optimism. Optimism says this glass is half full. That's the one we're, we're kind of more familiar with, right? And then there's realism. Realism might be a way that we look at the world in which we say, you know what, there's 500 milliliters of water in this glass. I did measure. There is 500 milliliters of water in this glass. And then of course there's pessimism which says this glass is half empty. There's a lot of isms out there. There's one called nihilism. Nihilism would look at this glass and say, this glass is meaningless, and I kind of want to spill it. <laughs> so, the thing of the matter is, you know, even if you, even if you happen to be kind of more idealist or more optimistic, the real question is, can we call that a right way of looking at the world? Or is that just some sort of contrived happiness? based on kind of willful ignorance or wishful thinking. And, uh, and even if we were to look at it through optimism, are we just ignoring the pain and, and suffering and the reality of the world? Now, I think to a certain extent we would be, right? So happy Mother's Day. Well, I want to show us what Jesus has to say about this, sort of this, a crucial framework for us to look at the world through a lens of joy. It comes from Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 to 23, and this is what Jesus says. Jesus says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Kind of a confusing passage, maybe, at first glance. Like, what are we supposed to do with this exactly? Well, there's some context behind it. And one of the, one of the things behind it is this notion of the evil eye. And we saw remnants of the evil eye today. We just use that expression, someone's giving me the evil eye. And usually what we mean by that is someone's giving me a nasty glance where someone's throwing some shade my way, right? But for ancient people, the evil eye meant there's a deeper meaning to it. The evil eye meant that if I were to look at you with bitterness and jealousy, you would become hurt by that. Or some future misfortune would take place in your life because of my evil eye glance. As a matter of fact, there's a work called the Talmud in which the, the Jewish people have writings from their rabbis, and they talk about this concept, the superstition of the evil eye. Here's one thing that they say. One who enters a city and fears the evil eye should hold the thumb of his right hand in his left hand and the thumb of his left hand 
in his right hand and recite the following. I, so-and-so, son of so-and-so, come from the descendants of Joseph, over whom the evil eye has no dominion. I mean, this was a, this was a concept that they feared and, and tried to create ways to find protection. You see the superstition that's involved in that. As a matter of fact, further down in that same passage, it'll say this. And if he is concerned about his own evil eye, lest he damage others, he should look at the left side of his nostril or at the side of his left nostril. And so if you were like, man, I'm afraid that I'm just going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to be bitter and jealous and look at somebody and I don't want to cause them misfortune, here's your solution. You just look at this bad boy right there and then you don't have to worry about accidentally glancing at anybody the wrong way, right? So as a matter of fact, there's amulets and charms all over the world from different cultures that have the same concept of an evil eye. Well, Jesus takes this concept and he turns it on its head and he says, you know, you think that the way that you look at the world, the way that you look at people harms others. But the fact of the matter is the way you look at the world harms yourself. And so if you're constantly looking at the world through a negative light, it will only breed darkness within you. As a matter of fact, Jesus will say, if the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? I think one of the things that he's saying is you have to recognize that some people enjoy looking at the world through a negative lens, through a negative perspective. And, and they enjoy, there's some sense of superiority that I get in that I can be uh, aware of the tragedies and, and the horrors and the terribleness of life. And because I can do that and I can recognize and even confess how terrible and awful life is, I'm superior to others who are too weak, who need to have a rosy point of view. And Jesus says, man, if that brings you joy, if you think that that's light, how great must that darkness be? And today I want to give you a biblical alternative that's off the spectrum. So we're not talking about, you know, some sort of wishful thinking. We're not talking about forcing myself to see this as ideal or forcing myself to see this as full or half full. But instead, what if I looked at this as a reminder of God's love? Something that's deeply rooted in reality, that God loves me. And so because of his love, I can look at the things in my life and see it as provision and see it as evidence of his love. The glass of water is a reminder of God's love for me. And so I want you to look at life through the lens of God's love. Not wishful thinking, but joy based on reality of life. Miroslav Volf, he's, the, he's a Protestant theologian, and he's the director for faith and culture at Yale University. And he says this about joy. He says, if joy meant simply feeling good, we could take a joy pill. You know, there are pills out there that would make us feel good. But joy is not feeling good. Joy is feeling good about something good. And so that's where joy comes from, feeling good about something good. Can we see the good in our lives and celebrate that joy? Here's how we do this. Here's how we look at the world through the lens of God's love in order to find joy. Number one is we look for his gifts. I am suggesting this morning that God has given you, no matter who you are, gifts. That there are things in your life that has, have come from the hand of God that you could look at and say, man, this has come from my heavenly Father. And as a matter of fact, Jesus says that God is a good Father who desires to give his children good gifts straight from the mouth of Jesus, evidence that God has given you good gifts. James says that every, every good and perfect gift comes from our Heavenly Father. And so there are good things in our life, and one way or another, we can attribute those good things to the first cause, to God, to the supreme good. And we can look at any good thing in our life and go, man, that is evidence that God loves me. So picture a mother for a moment, just to kind of deepen this understanding. Picture a mother for a moment whose child gives her a macaroni necklace, right? 
And it's not that it's made out of fine metals or jewels. It's not that it's worth a lot to the world. But she cherishes that necklace made out of pasta. Why? Because of who gave it to her. Because of the relationship that they have and because that child is precious to her. Think of a, a parent that has a, a child's artwork. I'm not, I don't know which way this goes. I forgot to ask. But, um, but it's precious to you, not because it's skillfully, masterfully done, but because of who it came from, what it means to you. So on Monday, we were having dinner at the, at the dining table, at, and, and Valerie and, and our oldest son, Jude, were, he's six years old, they were talking about how, um, how all the kids have blankets, and they have their names sewed onto their blankets, and, and, and so Valerie was talking about how she was going to do this for um, our new baby that's coming in October, and, uh, and Jude said, are you going to use your sewing machine? And, and Valerie said, well, I think I'm going to hand stitch it, hand sew it, because I'm not really comfortable with my sewing machine yet. And so Jude said, why don't you throw it away then? <laughs> and, uh, and her answer was, because it came from her grandmother. It was a gift from her grandmother. And because of that, it's precious to her. As a matter of fact, are there better sewing machines out there? Yeah, absolutely. Could we afford to buy a better sewing machine? Well, it depends on when payday is, but for the most part, yeah, we could afford to buy a better sewing machine. But would any sewing machine in the world be as valuable to her? The answer to that question is no. As a matter of fact, when I told Valerie that in passing that I was going to use this sewing machine for this sermon illustration, the next time I passed by her, she was crying. And I was like, honey, what's wrong? Have I done something wrong? Are you upset with me? Why are you sad? And she said, I was just thinking about my grandmother. Miroslav Volf, who I mentioned before, he talks about a tape measure that sold for $48,875. If anybody wants to buy this for $48,000, you, <laughs> you let me know. And, uh, but he said, why did it sell for so much? Not because it did anything special, but because... John F. Kennedy owned it. That's it. When well, we know who, who stuff belongs to, all of a sudden it has incredible value and worth to us. So the question is, can we do something similar in our lives where we go, man, there's this thing in my life and I, and I think it came from the Heavenly Father who loves me. And are we able to see joy through that lens? I remember... Um, a Toyota Echo, a $300 car was gifted to me right at the moment that I needed it. And, and I never even asked for it. And so it was easy for me to picture that this car came from God. And, um, and, and when I was a youth pastor, my students would make fun of me because they had nicer cars than I did. And I would say, yeah, but man, I really feel like this is a gift from God. I really feel like God wanted me to have this. And so you don't understand, but I cherish this and I value it more than if I had a better car. Are there things in our life where we could go, man, no, I really understand this to be from God. And if we cherish a sewing machine because it came from grandma or artwork because it came from a kid, or if this tape measure becomes worth $48,000 to somebody because it, it was owned by someone famous, how much more should the gifts in our life that we feel come from God, how much more should they mean to us when we start looking at the world through a lens of God's joy? So take stock of your life. What are the things that you go, man, this is a good thing. And scripture tells me that every good gift ultimately comes from God. And so somehow this has God's fingerprint on it. And, and because of that, I feel loved. And I'm going to allow myself to feel that as a gift from God. Number two, look for his character. So one, look, look for the gifts. Number two, look for his character. There's this passage in the scripture where Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who are sent to you, how I have longed to bring you under my wing like a, a, a mother hen. 
I love that passage, first of all, because Jesus is talking, but he's not talking out of his human nature. He's talking about his divine nature. You have this eternal God the Son that has watched as all over creation, this moment has repeated itself over and over and over again where a hen has gathered her chicks under her wing. And every time it happens, God the Son thinks, man, I can't wait to do that with my children. I'm jealous for my children of this moment that this hen gets to have with her chicks. Man, I can't wait for that. The hen reminds Jesus of the character of God and the love of God. Similarly, Jesus speaks to a woman at a well, and he says, I am the living water. Drink from me and thirst no more. Jesus is able to look at ordinary water and see the character of God, and he says, just as much as your body needs water, your soul needs me. And, and just as much as, as you need water, you'll have to come back to this well again and again but I am sufficient for you. And Jesus sees the character of God in something as simple as water. And so would it change our joy if we could see reminders of the character of God in everything around us, right? And so true story and ordinary. I was putting Jude and, and Shepherd to bed and Jude's looking out his window and he sees the sky as pink as could be. And he says, Dad, Shepherd, look how beautiful that sky is. It's pink. And he's, and he's seeing the sunset. And I just go, yeah, isn't God an amazing creator? Right? And we're taking the ordinary and we're allowing ourselves to see God's character in it and to allow ourselves to experience the joy that comes from that. The third one is this, enjoy to his glory. Enjoy to his glory. And what I mean by that is that there are certain things in our life that we could enjoy and our enjoyment of them glorifies somebody. So if a chef makes me a meal and he then or she then watches me enjoy that, they receive glory for it. They're complimented by me taking pleasure in it. So Paul will say, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. And one of the things that Paul is saying is enjoy it. Enjoy it thoroughly because as you do, God is complimented. And something happens when we praise or when we compliment, and that is our joy that we experience is um, completed or enhanced, right? If you've ever read a good book before, one of the, one of the, one of the things that heightens your experience of reading that good book is meeting somebody else that has read that good book too. And, and going, man, wasn't that book awesome? And all of a sudden you have more joy from that moment because you've been able to praise to somebody else and they've been able to understand that praise. Um, or, or have you ever tasted something good and just thought, man, I can't. You, somebody else here at this table needs to eat what I've eaten. They need to have this joy that I'm experiencing. When we're able to praise, it, it enhances joy and completes joy. And so when we can enjoy the things that God has given us and praise him for it, it takes that experience and heightens it so that we can have more joy in our life as a result of it. So if you want to fix your focus, begin to train yourself. Get used to practice looking at the world through a lens of God's love by looking for his gifts, looking for his character, and enjoying to his glory. We're going to give everybody a rose here. Um, every, every woman, um, there's enough for every woman to receive a rose for Mother's Day. And one of the things I want to do, so as you're headed out the door, make sure you grab one. Um, or hopefully somebody will be handing them to you. But what I want you to do, and what I want us to do together right now is just to use this as an example for what we've been talking about. Can we see the rose as a gift from God? Well, do we recognize that none of us would be here this morning if Jesus hadn't died for us? If Jesus hadn't died for us, there'd be no church. There'd be no reason for us to gather together this morning. And so the only reason that we're able to have a rose, get a rose, give a rose this morning is because of the work that Jesus did. Ultimately, we get this because of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Most theologians would tell you that every time you bring yourself into a means of grace 
one of the things that you've actually done is you've responded to an invitation, which means that every time that you have prayed, it wasn't your idea first, but it was God inviting you to pray, that the Holy Spirit put it on your heart to pray, and you responded to that invitation. And so when you come to church, one of the things that you can recognize is, man, I'm at church this morning because the Holy Spirit wanted me to be here, because he invited me to be here some way, one way or another. He put it on my heart to be here. And because of that fact, this rose this morning can be a, rem a gift to you from God. Lastly, man, as this thing was growing on the rose bush, isn't it true that God knew who would end up getting it? And so can I look at that as a gift from God and, and just go, man, even before this thing blossomed, God knew that it would be mine. And so it's a gift from him. Can I see God's character in the rose? Does, can I allow the red to remind me of the blood of Jesus, the price that God paid for me? Can I recognize that even though God is immense and powerful, he cares for and creates delicate things? Do I allow it to remind myself of the Garden of Eden and the fact that we have a God who wants intimacy and relationship with us? Can I look at the thorns and go, man, Christ wore a crown of thorns so that he could be my king? Can I see the character of God in ordinary things? And last of all, can I enjoy it to his glory? God, you've given me eyes to, to recognize the beauty of this rose. God, you've given me a brain to be able to appreciate patterns, variety, subtlety, uniformity. God, you've, you've, you're the source of beauty and in many ways the inventor of beauty. You've given me a nose to appreciate scent. God, I'm enjoying this gift to your glory. So Jesus says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be filled with light. So fix your focus and find joy today by looking at the world through the lens of God's love. That's our challenge this morning, and that's our invitation this morning, to start practicing seeing God's love in the world. And because of that, by that, experiencing, finding joy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, you, you put awe in this world. You put joy in this world. You through Jesus, invite us to look at the world through the lens of your love so that we can fill our whole bodies with light, so that we can see, we can see your love, we can see ways to feel good about things that are good. We can see true good in the world around us, and through that we can see your fingerprint and your love. God, if a tape measure becomes transformed in value to go from $7 to $48,000 based on who owned it, if a, if, a, if a sewing machine can become irreplaceable because of the love and relationship that's attached to it, God, would you bless everybody in this room, each and every person in this room, with the ability to see your love, your relationship, your gifts, your character through the ordinary. As we leave here this morning, may we begin to put that into practice. May we allow ourselves through faith to see your love for us in ordinary, everyday things. God, help us to see your gifts. 
Help us to see your character and help us to enjoy to your glory. We love you, Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand up all together. And sing this song. But I want you guys to just forget about yourself, whatever is surrounding you. Be yourself for the presence of the Lord.
O creator of the universe, eternal, good, holy, love, whose thoughts are not our thoughts, whose ways are not our ways, whose thoughts are above our thoughts, whose ways are above our ways. And he loves you. He loves you. And there is evidence of it in ordinary things all around you. May I hope that when we leave here this morning, we can allow things in our life to be transformed into infinite and precious worth because they came from a heavenly father who loved us, who loves us and whose worth is unimaginable and incomparable. I hope that you will see and appreciate a flower or a rose and be reminded of this immense love. I hope that you'll drink a, a, a sip of water and the next time you do, the worth of it will be transformed because you're looking at it through a lens of God's love. Man, wouldn't that be amazing if we could tap into that joy that's grounded in reality. As we say every week, the worship service is over. Let's go be the church. Amen. 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 God bless you. Have a good week. Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Yay!